What is up and welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. As you know, if you listened to the last episode where we talked about the Clutch City Houston Rockets, I'm leaning into the nostalgia of sports right now. Uh, Probably will release a regular episode soon, but I want to talk about more people's favorite teams today. We are talking about the 1994 San Diego Chargers, and I am joined by the man himself from the bogey blog, James Page. James, what is going on? What is going on, Brandon? It's a long time coming. Right? Yes. We worked together back in the day. So it's just Back awesome. in the day. At an unnamed gym chain that we yeah. will not mention. Exactly. Um, but no. Wait, 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 Freeman. Yes. When you shot me this a text about doing this, of course, you know I'm a big Nebraska fan. So the 94, 95, 97 seasons were like the first thing that I jumped to. But as I kept thinking about it is you know, I was 11, 12 years old in 94. And we didn't have the, the Instagram or the Internet. You know, my uh, news for the University of Nebraska was a small little snippet in the local newspaper. Or maybe when they play Colorado or Oklahoma, I can see the games. So as I thought about it real quick, being from San Diego, being in San Diego during the 94 season, I have more memories of that team than I do of 94, 95, 95, 95, 97 Nebraska. Because I learned more as an adult about those three national championships than I did as a kid. But the 94 Chargers, I was there. I remember right up your alley. Long, three decades later. No, so I was super interested in this, especially because like the later, the more recent Chargers teams, even like the LT, Philip Rivers one, like you hear a lot of talk about them. And then even a little bit before this team with Dan Fouts and Kellen Winslow, you hear some about them. But this was the only one that actually went to a Super Bowl. And I feel like it's the forgotten Chargers team. So let's go ahead and get into it. You mentioned you grew up in San Diego. So how and when do you remember becoming a Chargers fan? I'm sure they just like stamped it on you at the hospital. You know what, man? That's a really good question. It's it's so long ago that I couldn't even tell you. Um, to be honest, my grandfather had season tickets. As long as I can remember up to a certain uh, year after the Super Bowl, Um so as long as I remember, I was a Charger fan. My my uh, mom has a picture when I was, I think I was seven or eight, and I was when I was a San Diego Charger for Halloween. And I got the helmet, and I got the jerseys, you know. So as, as long as I can remember, I was a Charger fan. So I, we had a lot of bad years <laughs> leading up to this year. Maybe the two years before uh, 92 season, I think it was, was the first year I really, really remember stuff. I think that was the first Bobby Ross season was 92, if I'm not mistaken, based on my Mm -hmm. research. And so looking him up, I know of him because he went on to coach the Lions after the Chargers, but also he was the Citadel football coach for a while in the 70s. Yeah. Was that before he didn't he go to Army as well? Was that before Army? I don't know the timeline on that, but I remember, I think when he retired for good, I remember uh, the local paper, the Post and Courier, writing about former Citadel football coach retires. And then I know y'all hired him from Georgia Tech. This is how long ago it was. Georgia Tech won a share of the national championship under Bobby Ross with Colorado. Yeah. Yep. Look at you. I was like, there's no way, like Georgia, like football is what we're talking about. And yeah, it turns out Georgia Tech football, national champions. I knew that. I just didn't know what year it was. I didn't realize it was Bobby Ross. I thought it was like in the 70s or you hear about Minnesota having two national, three national championships in the 40s or something. Yeah. So that's where my mind went. 1990. Jeez. I know. I that was clearly a lifetime ago. But yeah, so the, the first... That first Raw season, that was a good one for you to become a fan. The the record was uh, 11-5 and that year, I believe. So what do you remember from that season? 
Well, I remember that season is that was the uh, it was a big deal, and I think it was like the first time anybody's ever started zero and four and made the playoffs. And I remember that. I, that's like I think as a Charger fan before then, but this is like the core memories. I remember we started off zero and four. Everybody wanted Ross out of town. My dad, who like watched football, but he never really went to the games. He wanted Ross out of town just because the newspapers wanted Ross out of town, <laughs> and this. All of a sudden, he started rolling off win after win after win, and he was winning conference games. You know, the Raiders and being the Denver and being uh, Kansas City, which is, were kind of our rivals, but no one cared about San Diego at that time. So it was like one way rival. And just all of a sudden, ripped off uh, a bunch of wins. And remember, remember correctly, they lost. I forget who they lost to. I want to say they lost to LA, to the uh, Raiders when they were in LA. Might be wrong on that one. And then everybody was like, oh, well, the ship has sailed. You know, we jumped the shark. It's over with. We're gonna we're gonna lose the rest of the year, and then that was the only game they lost until uh, I think the divisional round against. I want to say Miami. I could be wrong on that. But they do some. We won't. We won't fact that. check you. I might. I might look it up actually. But we won't hold you to it. But uh, that's funny that they wanted him gone, like right at the beginning of that season because it was his first year and he was inheriting a team. I think they were four and twelve. So it's not like he was getting like some super like a juggernaut of a team, but very little patience out there in San Diego at the time, I guess. I'm just I'm trying to remember, dude. It it, it was I, mean, I was ten, under ten years old during this season. So I mean, <clears throat> it's been a long time. I just remember the shirt. They had a shirt um, my mom bought, and it had the AFC title. On AC West title, I'm sorry. And it had a little weird charger looking dude kicking uh the LA Raiders mascot off or the and the Kansas City <laughs> mascot off and the Denver mascot off the top of the AFC West. I remember that shirt. Um but it's not a whole lot I really remember from that. I remember this kind of that little core nugget. Um I know they lost in the playoffs, I believe it was Miami. But the season itself, I <laughs> I couldn't tell you much about 92 or really. I know 93 was a bad year. I think we remember correctly, we went into 93 with kind of hopes and aspirations, kind of like every college football fan. Yeah, I was about to say, like, that's the worst thing to have as a fan is hope. Exactly. And then I think they finished eight and eight, missed the playoffs the, in 93, if I remember correctly. So that, that probably reset expectations. First of all, hilarious that because this is something that would happen to me as a Panthers fan too. Just the thought of a shirt celebrating winning a division like that's that's not something that I imagine the Patriots are doing or like teams that win things. That's something that we need to keep us moving when we pull for teams that aren't that great. Um, but yeah, so it sounds like expectations were kind of reset after that 93 season. Do you remember heading into 94 thinking, all right, we're going to get another, another one of these AFC West shirts this year? No, I think, um, I think it's when I started becoming, I don't want to say jaded, jaded is probably the wrong phrase to use, but as a Nebraska fan, you're as a Carolina fan. Yeah. I went to the season thinking, maybe, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah, just don't depress me. Yeah, exactly. So kind of that defensive, I want us to win, but I'm going to prepare for a bunch of losses type of deal. And honest to goodness, I think I didn't really register at that time, like when football season started. I think I know when school started, football season started. But I really couldn't tell you like what the aura around San Diego was. I think San Diego, even to this day, it's kind of been one of those cities sports wise, it's just been beaten down. You know, with the Padres and with the Chargers when they were there. You know, like when your best sport is minor league hockey or indoor soccer, it, it's kind of hard to be to look up and be excited going into the season. Um we went from the playoffs. Next year, eighty nine didn't make the playoffs. You go into the next season. I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer for you on what it felt like or how I felt. Um, I just know they ripped off like four or five wins in a row. Did you have like favorite players at the time? 
Yeah, dude. Um, of course, Junior Seau was one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Perfect Stanley. name for a linebacker, by yeah, the exactly. way. Exactly. I think he was like one of the last few first round picks the Chargers selected uh, up until Bether, the old GM, la- uh, was fired. I think there was one in 92 and 91. I don't know if there was one in 93. But Bobby Bether used to trade away all the first round picks for the Chargers. Every Bold strategy. Every year. Tra- trade them away. And so I think Junior and oh, I forgot who the. 93 guy was I looked it up earlier and I forgot who his name was. But anyways, uh, Junior Seau, uh Stan Humphries, a quarterback. Rodney Herman was a third down scat back. Nate John Means, University of North Carolina, he was the running back. Uh, Tony Martin, receiver. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, Gibson was a linebacker. Gibson is, I think his name is Gibson. I looked it up. Actually, I'm a lot. He is Gibson. I'm a roster from that year right here in front of me. <laughs> Um, this, um, there's a bunch of guys without looking at the roster, but Gibson was the guy who actually got the Chargers into the uh, Super Bowl against Pittsburgh. Um, John Carney, the kicker. Uh, I think Darren Bennett was the punter from Australia. Australia. He had a leg. Yeah, I think he was like one of the first punters to come across from Australia. Um, how was his name? I can see his face. I think his name is Ben, B-E-N-N. I could be wrong, but he was like the long snapper. He was there for like 17 years. This is so it, uh Papua. Papua. Remember, that was probably like my second favorite player. He's a tight end for the Chargers. It was like Alfred or something. So, yeah. so I have a lot of knowledge of this team. Not not specifically this year, but from a couple because they a lot of the guys were there a couple years after this. From um, Madden, like I can still hear <laughs> Pat Summerall saying Junior Seau's name. Like that's how I hear Junior Seau's name. And then you mention Natron Means. I knew him as a Jacksonville Jaguar. You mentioned he came from the University of North Carolina, but Means just a really good last name team. Means is a great name for a hard nosed runner. Seau we mentioned as a linebacker. Uh, who else? Even was Ronnie Harrison's uh, draft year. He got he drafted. Rookie year. He didn't really play that year. Not to my knowledge, no. But he was and, there. Uh, we had another guy, um, Carrington. Uh, I think that's Carrington. I literally had the yeah Carrington, Darren Carrington. Yeah, I think he's the one who passed away in that airplane crash in Florida uh, a few years later. We're definitely going to get to that because that 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 is the weirdest thing about this team to me. But I'm trying to see so. Uh, let's see. So Humphreys, let's, oh, let's go, let's go down the line and we'll talk about these players that you like. So Humphreys, his first year in San Diego was Ross's first year as head coach. So 94, he had a career year and this kind of showed looking up his career year stats showed how the game has changed. 3,200 yards passing, 17 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 58% com- completion percentage. Oh, Stan Humphreys. I thought you said and they trumped me. It's like, what? I, I misheard you. <laughs> no. Yeah, Stan Stan Humphrey. So like went to Louisiana Monroe, but just hearing those stats, I was like, that's probably someone getting run out of town today. Like it was only one of the few years where he had a a good, a positive touchdown to interception ratio, which is nothing we would have cared about at the time. I mean well, I think a lot also at the same time back in the nineties, you no know, NFL was run heavy. Yep. No, well, Nature means, I mean, he was a 240 pound back, if not bigger. Yeah. Like you you just wouldn't see that today. He was like 5'10. He was built like a fire hydrant. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And with Stan Humphreys, um, I can't remember when it happened. I want to say the year next year or the year after, maybe. Um, he got massive, started getting concussions. The offensive line just kind of fell away. And he just, I remember this one, I forgot what game it was, but like he just got smacked. And you can see on his face, they zoomed in on his face. And then you can see that there was no one home. He was awake, but no one was home. And that's kind of when his career really took a downfall for the and most that's, part. That's back when they were like, all right, and you're going back in the game. Here you yeah. go. Exactly. Good luck, Here's, buddy. Jeff Brown was on that 94 team. The head coach gotcha. was on the 94 team. So they had a a lot of of guys who went into coaching. I saw uh I think Eric Bienemy 
was a backup running back. Yeah, he's still behind uh, Nick Ramin. Yep. Yep. And then, and you mentioned Ronnie Harmon. That was an interesting guy to me because, like you said, third down back, but he was one of the leading receivers on the team. And he it was, was like, like so I remember going, he was always the go to guy. Anytime third down two and above, you knew they weren't going to give it to, to Natron because this he's a fire hydrant, but he's only going to get three yards. Yep. When, so usually it was Ronnie was on a little swing pass or on um a little not corner route, but he kind of cuts out and comes in across the middle. He's shifty. He's kind of like a uh, uh, was it Darren Daryl Darren Sproles from several years ago. Okay, or, uh, the new Kansas State guy that said uh, um, Dallas to got drafted his last year. He wasn't as small, but shifty as a son of a gun, and was always open and can get you those few yards that you need just for the first down. And I, who else was I looking up? Okay, so you mentioned Tony Martin. So this was. That was another thing I found interesting about this team when I was looking up. I didn't know if, if you knew this, but that was Natron Means was his first year as the starting running back. It was his second year in the league, but they had just gotten rid of Marion Butts, um, which is, a, I guess they got rid of him because Butts as a last name isn't as good as Means. <laughs> and, and then they would gotten rid of a guy, Anthony Miller, who was a thousand yard receiver. And they just kind of went with a couple of different receivers. So it was interesting to me that they got rid of these guys who had put up numbers and brought in new guys. And then you got Humphreys with a career year and they used that to get to the Super Bowl. I was like, how often does that happen? And will the Carolina Panthers ever do it so I can feel joy? Maybe. I don't know if you guys keep firing coaches after less than a year. That guy is super impatient. That's actually my dream job is... Carolina Panthers head coach for a couple games and then get paid to go away. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the roster. I mean, look at the defense from the 94, 93 season. There's looking at it. There's a lot of guys who came back on that defense. I feel like um, the Chargers defense was or the team was very, very defensive heavy. But yes. They had nature on to control the game. Yes. Stan Humphreys, who was kind of like an Alabama quarterback of well, old anyways, who just needs to get to get the ball to Tony Martin, get the ball to uh, Pupuno, get the ball to Ronnie Herman when he needs to. Every once in a while, get it to um, – God, I lost his name. I got to cheat and look at my list. Uh, You're allowed. To, yeah, I appreciate it. Get it to be enemy every once in a while. You know, it, it's – the defense was probably the most solid. You know, was Leslie Nelson on that, on, the, on that team? He was. Okay, Leslie, he hadn't left for Kansas City yet. Alessio O'Neill, defensive end, John Perella, uh, Perella, a Nebraska guy, actually, defensive tackle. Those were studs up front, not including Mims and uh, Ruben Davis and Rayleigh Johnson. A different Reggie White on that Yeah, team. I saw they had a second, the other Reggie White. Uh, Leslie O'Neill. So you mentioned, you mentioned Leslie O'Neill. That dude, a forgotten name on a team that I mentioned we don't really talk about. That dude was racking. I think he had like 130 career sacks. Like Leslie O'Neill was incredible. I remember him from Madden as well. He was still on the Chargers when I finally got the game. What I remember for him is he always wore the red visor. That's oh, right. The red visor when he was with the Chargers. I think it was with, even with the Chargers, he wore a red visor. He wore a visor anyway, and I always remember that. I saw him one time at a restaurant. A really nice restaurant when I was a kid. I was so scared to go talk to him because he was there with his wife having a nice dinner. My dad's like, yes, right. let's, let's see O'Neal. I was like, cool. I'm not going to go bug him. He's with his wife. But I remember me, not me, I was seeing him one time. I didn't meet St. Humphreys one time at a, a, a autograph signing. Was he a nice guy? Uh, you can tell he didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> It was the, all the concussions. The lights probably hurt his eyes. He needed to get yeah. out of there. You might have been. But yeah, it sounds. Where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, going on a board. No. Now. And so I looked up a couple of other guys on that team. Uh, do you remember Mark Say, a receiver? Uh, vaguely. I don't remember him as a charger. I thought he was with somebody else. So he was on this team. He had like just over 600 yards receiving. And I looked him up because I was like, who is this guy? One of the most incredible stories I've ever read in my life. So he 
His dad died of a stroke when he was 14. I think it was from L.A. He played two years in of baseball in the Texas Rangers farm system. And he decided, all right, I'm going to go play football now. In 88, the year he was going to play football at Cal State Long Beach, he was at a Halloween party for his uh, nieces and nephews. He got shot because uh, I guess a uh, drive-by or something happened outside the house. He dove on his niece to protect her, got shot, lost a kidney, and could only eat soup for like two months. The bullet, in addition to losing the kidney and puncturing his lung, it got lodged by his heart. And so his school didn't want to let him play football, and he had to sue them to play football. Yeah. And then he gets to play football, Cal State Long Beach, goes undrafted, is a practice squad guy. And this was his first year actually seeing the field in the NFL. And he was like y'all's fourth receiver or something. But I was like, this story here is nuts. Mark Say, another last name guy, not not really applicable. I guess wide receivers talk a lot. So true. I remember seeing him as I think as an eagle as I'm looking at it. Yep, yep. What is his name? And then another guy I remember from that team as a Bronco is Darian Gordon, who was like he was on the Broncos Super Bowl teams and he was a returner. And I remember very vividly as a child against the Panthers, he he returned two punts for touchdowns in the first quarter where they just blew the Panthers out. And I just I just couldn't believe it. I think the shortest one was 75 yards, and I just couldn't believe that the Panthers didn't know how to tackle properly. Now I know better. I know they don't know how to tackle properly, but... At that time, you were... You thought they knew what they were doing. I was young. You you have optimism. You you think the guys are going to do better. You're naive. So... Personally, I know that feeling all too well as a corner Oscar fan and as an old Charger fan. Yes. So that's enough about my childhood. So we got your favorite players. So at this point, you mentioned you're young, but when was it starting to click like, oh, this Chargers team might be different than the past ones or had the that being jaded already kicked in to where you just didn't believe until you saw it? I think it was you just didn't believe they saw it type of deal. Um, well, we had been to the playoffs a couple of times that the 92 season that we spoke about earlier when they went 0 and 4 and then ripped off uh, a bunch of wins minus one. Um, they went to the playoffs that year, so there's excitement there. But there, there's if you have anybody who is listens who lives in San Diego, you know that there's this aura with us San Diegans that oh, cool, we're doing great, we're gonna make the playoffs, but we're never gonna get to the next level. You know, we have saw with the Padres in 82 when they had one of the – I think they had a – not the one the – they probably had one of the best records. They went and got beat uh, four games to one by Detroit. We saw it again uh, in 95, 96 when they went to the World Series. They got swept by the Yankees. Yankees. A couple years ago when they went and lost to your Dodgers. We saw it last year – or two years ago when they beat your Dodgers, but they got beat by Philadelphia, you know? So we're just so used to this. Oh yeah. We're going to get to the playoffs. Awesome. But let's not think ahead of ourselves. Um, yeah. It's always kind of been an aura that I remember feeling as a charger fan or as, as of San Diego in, in general, like we were always a step below somebody or two steps below somebody. So, you know, being going into that season, yeah. As the season went on, it was just kind of, oh, cool, we're winning games, but we're, we're losing games. It's Are we going to make the playoffs? Maybe, but we didn't make it last year with an 8 8 record. We'll see what happens type of deal. I mean, <laughs> looking at the schedule, we did ripped off six straight in a row, then they lost. They lost one, lost one, lost one, lost two. Then they beat the Jets and Pittsburgh to finish off the season. I don't think there's a whole lot of excitement going in to the playoffs uh did they make was it they they won division if i remember correctly god damn i got a cheat here brandon i was hoping not to cheat it's okay it was so long ago 
Yeah, so they didn't have to deal with the wild card, which is nice. But um, I do remember I went to that AFC uh, divisional game against uh, Miami. That was nuts, just reading about it. So what do you remember from that? Because it was against the Dolphins, a rematch from when they beat y'all a couple years before. Uh, what I remember uh, was, first off, it was raining. It never rains at freaking Wow. Sunday. It was raining. That's the um, most shocking thing that's ever, because I was about to make a joke about how y'all can't win championships because it wouldn't be fair to have the weather that nice and you're winning, but it, it was, was raining. raining. Yeah, because uh, I remember... Usually, somebody I say, some my grandfather had season tickets, and but usually my mom and I would go to the games. So just her and I, and for some reason it was raining. My mom didn't want to go out, so she didn't have my dad take me. Um, and he didn't want to go. Some of that freaking pissed her off, some fierce because she didn't want to go, but she knew I wanted to go. So we went and sat in the rain, and of course, my grandfather had great seats, but we were two rows below the overhang. <laughs> So we're two rows oh. back. We're dry. We're two rows forward. We're getting wet. Um, but I remember being. I don't remember the game itself. I remember the the field goal that they missed. I, um, we were we had aisle seats. I remember standing in the aisle and he kicked it. And if you're from the side, you can't tell which direction it is. You know, you can see if it if it's. No, sorry, I got someone up my door. Someone is at the um, door. Thank you, Alexa. You can see if it's long, you can see if it's short. Um, so it looked long, of course, but then I remember the whole end zones just exploding in cheers. And then I looked up on the scoreboard and it said, uh, Miss Google. And I just remember fucking celebrating, going, oh my God, <laughs> almost <laughs> coolest moments. Um, didn't really register at that time what was going on. It just, Something good had happened, and you knew that. <laughs> the fact that we stayed, I thought we were just going to leave. Once he had lined up for the field goal, so I think it was only like a 30 or 40 or field goal. It wasn't very long. This is back in the day when kickers actually missed or made the field goals. Yes. Didn't miss the PAPs. Uh, so when he missed it, it was like, holy crap, what? Cool, we actually won a playoff game. Wow, we haven't done that in a minute. I think that would have been. Would have been brutal to be sitting there in the rain and then lose on a last second field goal. It would have been. It really would have been. A weird side note story to that. Um, I remember because everybody stayed in the stadium to celebrate, and I went and used the restroom. I remember this junk guy came into the restroom, fucking Super Bowl, sorry, cussing, fucking Super Bowl, going to the Super Bowl. I'm like, we won one game. One game. So we, got, we still have to go. To somewhere else and play and at the time uh I didn't know pittsburgh had won their divisional yet so that was the next round the afc championship game against the steelers i guess a better question too because uh, we just talked about just played the dolphins how much did you know about like opposing teams going into the matchups at the time um the not much i knew more about pittsburgh mainly because you know, had, did uh, Coach Calvert there? Um, uh, the quarterback. I was just looking at his name. Oh, Neil O'Donnell. That's right. Yep, Neil O'Donnell. Um, Bam Morris and uh, Tony Mackerel, running back. Uh, I knew a little bit about him. I didn't know a whole lot. Miami. Only person I knew was Dan Marino. You know, um, I just I think at that time for him, I knew that nah, he's going to be one of those guys that gets so close but never gets over the top. You know, he's kind of had a feeling to him. Yeah. Uh, so going into the Miami game, I didn't. There, there, there wasn't a twelve-year-old was a scouting at that time. I was just yeah. going, not having a clue really who the other team was or who was on the other team. I just remember O'Donnell because Pittsburgh was like the team. It was Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and Dallas at that time were the teams in the NFL. There wasn't really anybody else, especially in the AFC, if I remember correctly, who had people with big names you know yeah i was looking at the the standings from that season and yeah it was just the asc was kind of kind of weak outside of pittsburgh and they i think they went 12 and 4 that year with with old neil o'donnell uh what was the hope like going into that one where you're like okay neither wasn't <laughs> so it was pittsburgh i mean, every, I mean pittsburgh 
they had those the mid nineties or started their run. Well, didn't they won? Didn't they win one in the mid nineties area? They didn't win one, but they did go back against Dallas. Might have been the year after this. So they they were like they were in the middle of something. Like it was good. Yeah, they were good. The only thing I remember about them was like they were the team with the FC. That was it. I mean, Neil O'Donnell, um, God, Dick Penn, I remember him. But they were the their defense was stout. The steel curtain was back. No one was going to beat them. Like you said, they went, what was their record? You see, they lost four games that year. Yeah. 12 and four. So we went in knowing that, okay, we, we're not going to beat them, but we got to the AFC Championship. That's how beat down we were as <laughs> San Diego and just all right well we're not going to beat them but I'm still going to root for them I'm still going to watch the game and let's just hope they keep it within striking distance and freaking hell sure enough they did yeah so you said you watched the game what do you remember from that especially as the game's going on and you're kind of you're still in it oh yeah that's a good question um I remember I watched the game by myself. Uh, we had a, a, a an office or a den is what we called it. But it was my little room. So I can play my video games. I can watch TV. So I remember my parents were in the other room, in the main living room, watching t- watching the game. And I was watching in my little room. And you know, it was only like a 17, 13 game or something like that. Yeah. Was you, nailed, you nailed it exactly. 17, 13. Um, I just remember it looked cold. This is back at Three Rivers where they had concrete for a field. Yep. It looked hard <laughs> on TV. Um, I wasn't expecting them to win, but the fact that it was still close um, going into the fourth quarter actually uh, was nice. I can't remember. I can't believe I can't remember the touchdown that they scored on to take the lead. Because they were is, is there, so was there any reason that that y'all would watch the game separately as a family? Was your family like <laughs> was everyone else just like okay, we know how this is going to end, but we'll let little James believe like Santa or something. Uh you know what? I think I just wanted to be kind of by myself. I'm kind of the same way now, especially when I watch Nebraska games. Uh, I don't sit down when I watch Nebraska. I'm always doing something inside my house, but I got the game on right there, so I can watch it. Um, I don't like watching with people when I'm watching Nebraska play. Uh, I think I'm, I was the same way with at this time frame, too, apparently, because I think if the game got out of hand, I can change the channel or I can turn on my video games and play Madden and, and pretend like I was the Chargers and beat the hell out of the Pittsburgh team now. Um, so I think that's, that's why I, I was middle sanctuary, if I remember correctly. And, uh, that's why I was watching it by myself. And so I had it backwards. Like your, your, your parents are probably in the living room, full on believing. And you're in there like these assholes are gonna, they're gonna blow it. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. It, again, it's, I think it's in my forties now it's followed me ever since then. <laughs> So, so, okay, we're getting to the bottom of things. I'm hoping this is therapeutic for you as well. I don't know why I pay a therapist. It's freaking up. <laughs> <You> just, <laughs> just go on podcasts and talk about your sports uh, memories. Uh, so, so you win the game. What is the thought now you can actually celebrate with your family again <laughs> that y'all are going to the Super Bowl? Oh, man, you know, um, I remember they had driven down all, all the way down the field. And I think it was a fourth down, or was this the last two seconds, wherever it was, because they needed a touchdown to, to win. There wasn't a field goal to tie it. They needed a touchdown. And I just I remember sitting there on my stomach and just watching it intently, and he's just been moving the ball all the way down the field. And I forgot who, who, who he targeted. And there was a split second when um, – it was Gibson who just dove in front of the ball and knocked it down. And like, I couldn't believe it. Like I was like, for a split second, I was like, what, why are they celebrating? He didn't catch that. And we had a low ceiling in this um, den. And I remember getting up and jumping up and my wrists on. 
Um, for me, probably the most the happiest I've been in as a sports fan, it's more outgoing celebration I've ever done in my life. Because I was, yes, I was by myself, but I was jumping up and down and our stupid little den because some guy named Gibson locked a football away to make sure Pittsburgh didn't win. Uh, but to answer your question, um, once I knew it was San Francisco, I was like, oh, shit. I'm sorry for, sorry for cussing. <laughs> No, you're you're allowed to cuss here. We do it all the time. Um, so before we get to how short lived the joy was, am I correct in assuming there's never been a sports moment in your life like this again in terms of level of happiness? Yes, that's okay. one of this, I, it's funny because I was thinking about this yesterday. Because um, leading up to this podcast, and I mean, is that the happiest I've ever been? I mean. So a couple of years later, Nebraska wins their third national championship in my lifetime. But I was more happy about this than I was about that game. Um, because I'm, I'm a huge Nebraska fan. I, I didn't – I'm so – I feel like I'm, I'm like the curse for some teams. Like the three national championships for Nebraska, I didn't watch. Just out of fear that, well, if I watch, they're going to lose type of deal and this is like this game was like, the first game i actually remember seeing watching from start to finish even though i know there's plenty of times during the first half where i, I wanted to turn the game off but yeah this is probably the happiest moment as a sports fan i've been up to that point and definitely after that point it's depressing but also beautiful how i feel like for a lot of us it is like a a childhood memory that we just can't top when it comes to sports because then like as you get older and you start learning more about sports you can't really recapture the naive part of you that makes that happiness so pure and so it's it's so fun cuz like man i would pay a monthly subscription if I could feel that just once a year, like my happiest childhood sports memory, but it's gone. And here we are now. That's true. So, sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, so, so you mentioned the happiness was short lived uh, because you were facing the San Francisco 49ers. And I looked up this roster and whole Lee shit. I haven't even looked it up, but I remember. Like you had Dion, you had Young, you had um Plumber, who was your linebacker, you had oh, dude, that's just the top three off the top of my head. Jerry Rice. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I, I gotta, Ricky Waters. Waters, yeah, freak right there. Um you can see the defensive side. Uh Eric Davis, yeah, freaking Merton Hanks. I remember his celebration when he would return an interception. Stubblefield, Bryant Young, yeah. <laughs> it was, was it, Ken Norton Jr. Um, so that year, Steve Young was the league MVP. Dion was the defensive player of the year. The craziest thing was Jerry Rice in the first game of the season broke Jim Brown's all-time touchdown record. This was 1994. He played 10 more seasons after that. Yeah. Split between uh, San Francisco and uh, uh, Oakland with the uh, 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 oh my god, the other Brown. What's his first name? Uh, Tim Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, like what do you know, Jerry man? Rice. <laughs> no, Jer Jerry Rice will just incredible to do that and then oh, i've got 10 years left to add on to this record is insane that's why he's the man he's these no one's ever going to touch him as, as receiver no no so uh you mentioned this was tough going into it this was the second largest spread in super bowl history y'all were an 18 and a half point underdog yeah, that at all. I, I think uh, going. I think ninety four season was kind of like that dream season. You know, everyone wants to like like TCU last year. Yep, he got into the playoffs. 
They made it to the championship. It was a dream season. There is no way in God's green earth they're going to beat Georgia. Were they expected for them to get blown out as bad as they did? No. They, with the, people thought they might keep it somewhat close, maybe within 20. But it was a dream season for them. I think 94 was definitely the dream season for the Chargers. Um, it was just one of those years that things kind of fell right for us, us for them. And, you know, if O'Donnell went to a different receiver, Pittsburgh would have been in. Yep. You know, but he, that was open. And if Gibson was a half a second late making his dive to knock the ball away. You no, know, So this the ball bounced the right way for the Chargers that, during that year. Go up against San Francisco, who was just on a massive roll going in. I, I, can, I can see their coach's na- face. I can't think of his name, though. I think, was it George Seifert? Yeah, it was. I can't remember his damn name, but I can see his face. And I remember I remember that year, they are talking about the damn uniforms. Like, they had the weird throwback uniforms that had a, a shadowing on them. And it was like, they're undefeated wearing these uniforms this year. So he, he wore them the rest of the year. Um, wow. I think fourth season was that the year they kind of did the um throwback uniform year. It used to be a big thing back in the nineties where they started doing throwback uniforms. So I, I know that think you're right because I think I read that when I was researching. Yes. So the Chargers had the, their white helmets with the numbers and the bolts, which then the baby blues and all that stuff, and the Broncos had the weird looking horse on the side of the helmet. Yeah. So I think, uh, if I remember correctly, they, they were winning games wearing those uniforms, and they stayed wearing those uniforms, and then they just I'm not saying there was a uniform. I think there was the team that we just talked about, but it probably was more the stacked team we talked about. But I mean, it can't it can't hurt to stay with the uniform. I mean, it, it's not crazy if it works. I'm gonna take it as as a fan of a team that got beat by 130. Yeah. So how long into this game did you still have hope or any hope? And where were you watching it? Were you back in the den? I mean, uh, were you back in the the the, the James the Cave? Oh, the den. Um, I, you know what? I, I didn't even give us any hope going into that game, to be honest. Probably smart, there- honestly. There wasn't, I don't think there was any, like any little, well, maybe type of deal. I was like, dude, I'm 12 and I know Jerry Rice and Steve Young and Stubblefield and Deion Sanders. Those are dudes. Yeah. Stan Humphreys is not a dude. No, he's Stan Humphreys. Stan Humphreys. Nature means he can only do so much. Maybe our defense might hold them, but reality, what offenses have they faced all year long? Now, we even just said several months ago that hey, Pittsburgh was still not, was the steel curtain, so they were a defensive-oriented team. If you scored 17 points, obviously you win against Pittsburgh. I, I just I remember going, I just there wasn't a chance in my head uh, for us winning that game. I think I watched – Probably the first quarter, and I don't even know how bad it was. <laughs> the first quarter. Uh, it was it was fourteen uh, seven after the first quarter, but it was then twenty eight to ten after the second quarter. Uh, I remember thinking Jerry Rice caught a, a seam pa- uh, or to, uh, to a seam route like seventy some yards or some stupid like that. It was a long pass. Um, mm. the, the one. I, I laugh uh, about the thing I see because we were talking about this particular individual yesterday via text. But I remember uh, uh, Nate John Means took a carry, and they were just talking about Deion Sanders. The, the commentators were about how you're going to see Deion Sanders in coverage, but you're going to very rarely see him come up and stop the run. And sure enough, Nate John Means gets the ball. I think the second next player to play after, and Deion got in there, but it was just a speed bump for Nate John. And I just left because we were talking about texting about Colorado yesterday. Um, and I think that was like the last player I really remember watching. And then um, I think I went outside and played with my, with my friend. Probably pretty smart because, yeah, it got out of hand quickly. And, yeah, Dion, that's something I do remember vividly from childhood, too. 
Now, I don't like, I remember his punt returning skills in particular, but then also how he was just always making a business decision when it came time to tackle. And you just wouldn't see him make tackle. You're just like, I'm not, no thanks. Smart. I mean, it worked out all right for him. We're just talking about nature on being like 240. Do you want, and you called him a fire hydrant. If you're Dion. Do you want anyone to tackle that? No, no. I hope he doesn't step on you. Because my thought would be okay, he got past Dana Stubblefield, Bryant Young, Ken Norton Jr. He got past all these guys. If they couldn't stop him, what chance do I have? Like, let's just let the man go. That's very true. Very, very true. So it, it did get ugly 49 to 26. Steve Young had six touchdown passes. Jerry Rice caught three of them. You mentioned you weren't really hopeful going in. So was there a lot of disappointment or was it like, okay, that was a good season, good for us? I think they said there wasn't a whole lot of hope going in. But then as a fan, you kind of have a small little bit maybe. You know, like we talked about earlier, it's like you go into the season with hopes, but you expect to be disappointed. And that's kind yeah. of what I think this game was for me. It was coming out with hopes, hope it wasn't you, you, you – we're going to be disappointed, but if you are great, I think the area where I was more disappointed as a fan was the final score. Yeah, you know, if it, I mean, if it was thirty something to twenty six, okay, sure, but it was forty nine to twenty six. At it least was, cover the spread. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, after the first quarter, there was no hope. No, if they played the first half and then got beat out at the second. In the second half, okay, cool. We tried. We came in, we gave them a shot. We rattled them a little bit, but not enough because they were a much better team and we lost. Instead of we kind of took a shot, but they hit us two more times and then we really couldn't get back on our feet. And we we're uh, not in our butt. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of reminds me of shooting to Nebraska real, real, real quick, the 2001 National Championship against Miami. Knew Miami was going to kick our butt. Didn't expect it to be that much of a butt kicking. Same concept here. Knew San Francisco was going to kick the Chargers' butt. Wasn't expecting that bad. So, yeah. The Chargers didn't even make the playoffs the next year. I think this is kind of – oh, yeah, they didn't. They made they lost to Indianapolis in the wild card. So did that change – your expectations heading into that next season where you're like, okay, we can make it back. Or are you still like, no, I know who these people are. They're going to depress me. Um, it was the second one for sure. I think mm -hmm. even as an 11, 12 year old, uh, I understood the aura of San Diego understood that this was a one-off deal, but again, like a normal fan, there's that hope there's that, okay, maybe we might be able to make a deep run in the playoffs. Maybe we can build off of this. Um, but I think that was the next year was when Stan started having those concussions. Um, I think Natron was limped up in that next year too, because he was the workhorse the year before. Yeah. So that next year, I don't think there was a whole lot of hope going in. <clears throat> um, I think it was 13. Was it, yeah, it was 13 at that time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my answer. For that. I don't, there, there, there was, the aura of San Diego and one. okay, we had our run. Okay. Let's just hope we get back to the playoffs and not be crummy. It got crummy kind of quickly, I feel like, uh, because the next Chargers memory I have would be Ryan Leaf. <laughs> Is that 98? That well, I think yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf draft, which looking back, kind of funny. So we're who we've moved past. We're in this post Super Bowl hangover. What do you remember? You're a little older. What do you remember about the, like the Ryan Leaf era? Did y'all knew that? It's over like no other. <laughs> it was. They had shirts made, turn over a new leaf. Man. Yeah. Uh, so, I, and I, I remember the city, the people who cared about the Chargers um, were split. Now, some wanted Peyton, some wanted Ryan. Um, 
Payne, I think, had just lost the national championship to Nebraska the year before. And Ryan, I think he won the Rose Bowl to Washington State that same year. Could be he wrong. was incredible in college. Yeah, he was. Of course, no one realized how much of a dick he was until 30 for 30 came out. Too late, yep. <laughs> but um, I think a lot of people wanted Ryan because, you know, I, I could be wrong with my bowl games, but I think yeah. since he won the – the Rose Bowl with Washington State and then Peyton lost the national championship against Nebraska and didn't look all that great against Nebraska. To be fair, 97 is probably one of Nebraska's best teams ever besides the 94, maybe 95 season. Um, a lot of people want to Ryan Leaf. And plus, he was a little bit, I think he was bigger than uh, Peyton, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it could be yeah. wrong with numbers. So it was kind of split, but I think more people are leaning towards Ryan. Um, I. Personally, I kind of wanted Peyton. I didn't like Peyton because I just I just don't like the Manning for some reason. I don't know why. I just don't like him. I like him now. The Eli and Peyton are great now. I just hate him as players. So let me put it that way. Um, but I felt like Peyton was a better quarterback. I feel like he didn't so much play off a of raw talent like Ryan did. He was more cerebral. Yeah, you have to see that as he got into his career. You know, it came, yeah, it became pretty obvious, but yeah, because I remember Ryan certainly looked the part, like even when he was young, Peyton looked a little bit schlubby almost, like he didn't look athletic, he always had like the giant forehead. <laughs> and like, I remember because my grandfather was a Tennessee fan, so watched a lot of Peyton Manning, that's some of my earliest memories, and it was always kind of like Peyton Manning can't win the big one like he would always lose to florida or somebody and ryan leaf like you said he ended his, his career on a high note i think you're right about that and he he just looked the part he had a cannon for an arm unfortunately he couldn't throw it to the right people but uh and he was an asshole he was Did, one of those guys maturity until he was arrested <laughs> yes which is you certainly hope to grow up before you get arrested multiple <laughs> times. Like yeah. that's that's the hope. Did you feel like well you did say that you felt like there's a, a San Diego type curse with the sports teams? That was the other thing about this 94 Super Bowl team. How many people associated who were on that team died? Died early. Good question. So I've got the list. If if we didn't depress you with me telling you that you will never be happier than you were as a child, then let's go through some some player deaths. Uh, linebacker David Griggs died in. You get the roster real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. Uh, David Griggs, 28 linebacker, died in a car crash in '95. Uh, running back Rodney Culver, 26, died in a plane crash in 96. It was a big commercial uh, plane crash. Was he the one that died in Florida? Okay. Yep. Oh, he's the one that died in Florida, not Carrington. My bad. Sorry, Carrington. If you're Carrington. Listening, still alive. Yeah, sorry. sorry about that. That's a fine. Like uh, I don't think you're allowed to kill that man. But so Rodney Culver, then you got linebacker Doug Miller, 29, struck twice by lightning while camping in 98. So you hear lightning can't strike twice. Turns out it can. Uh, center Curtis Whitley, 39, drug overdose in 2008. Now we're starting to get into like the football effects deaths that we see now. Uh, defensive end Chris Mims, 38, cardiac arrest, 2008. Uh, defensive tackle Sean Lee, 44, cardiac arrest, double pneumonia, 2011. Linebacker Lewis Bush, 42, heart attack, 2011. The big one everyone knows about, linebacker Junior Seau, obviously suicide, 43, 2012. And then the center, Courtney Hall, natural causes at the age of 52 in 2021. That's a lot of guys. Courtney Hall passed away? Yeah. That's a name I, I forgot to say, but I don't know. Oh, damn. All right. That made me depressed, Brandon. 
You're welcome. This was okay, but Courtney Hall, the one guy that I can't believe I didn't say was on my list of favorite players because I knew he was there. I didn't realize he passed away. It was recent though, right? Yeah, so, it was recent. And he was older too. So, so like if the second half of those were more of more common of what you would see from guys who played football, unfortunately. Oh, uh sure. the first part, like Obviously, car crash, commercial airline crash, struck twice by lightning. That's kind of, are we cursed Final Destination type deaths? I mean, the airplane crash one, unfortunately, that took a lot of the people with it. Yeah. The only one that sticks out to me that's kind of Final Destination is that, was that Griggs you said the guy struck by lightning twice? Doug Miller. Miller. Doug yeah. Miller. Yeah, struck that's, by lightning. That's more Final Destination stuff. Because to me, that tells me he may have survived the first one, which what are the odds you get struck by lightning and then survive it? And then the lightning was like, no, wait a second. We got to come back for round two. That's insane. I couldn't find any article telling the whole story, but he was like camping. I think he was getting ready for some sort of charity event out in the wilderness or something struck by lightning twice. That was insane. Sucks. Especially when you consider the chargers nickname, like <laughs> hear him called the bolts. That's true. That is very true. So rest in peace to all those guys. I think we're at the point now where if anyone yeah, else dies, I, I won't be too, I'll be like, okay, you played professional football all these years. You, you're supposed to be dead by now. Um, I, I don't know. Thank you for watching. I have my people mixed up. But. Yeah, yes. Still alive, knock on wood. Uh, so that was insane. And well, damn. yeah, so just a little bit of a bummer there. But you mentioned Ryan Leaf. You mentioned your hatred of the Mannings. We're in that post-Super Bowl hangover that's still going on. Do you still hate Eli for not coming to San Diego? Or did you hate him at all? Uh, of course I hate him. He was a man. He was playing football. Yeah. Okay. Like, I like him now. They're, they're funny. They're great. They're they're not great. I don't know who they are, but they're funny. I love the shows he put on. They, they seem like people who they don't take things too serious. Which Yes. Is, as a football player, probably mainly as a fan, no, screw them both. Okay. W were you like offended he didn't want to come to San Diego and force that trade? Um, at the time, yes. But as I got older, you know, they did that 30 for 30 thing. And, you know, I listened to that and, and I watched it. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the organization, the charter organization was, and still, to my personal opinion, not the best inside, in, in house. Um, again, I think that 94 season was a fluke. Yeah. Guys like Junior Seah, who was a, a leader, um, Bobby Bethard, who was okay. The older Spanos, who was the older, who was the owner, um, I feel like he led the team as it should be. I mean, he's built his business out of nothing, and he led that team like he like his business. I think one to me against his oldest, in my opinion, once his son took over and, or started taking over, I feel like that's when everything behind the scenes and inside the house started crumbling. And he saw that with Eli Manning. He didn't want to come to San Diego. You want to go to New York. And it's like, cool, do you want the bigger publicity in New York where you're going to be stuck under the microscope? Or do you want to come to San Diego where you're going to get paid? You might not win as much, but you got the weather. And you're not going to be underneath this microscope and you're going to be probably worshipped as a god because you're the first overall pick. And he chose New York. I don't, the Mannings don't show to me, anyways, that they're all about the publicity to an extent. You know, um, they do stuff. A lot of times it's funnier. They're poking fun of themselves. So going to New York in that, this vacuum, I wouldn't, uh, looking back on it now, I was like, why would you do that? Just kind of looking at who I think the Mannings are. Yeah. When you hear about, all the internal crap with the chargers. And I was like, Oh, okay. That's why. And that explains why Ryan Leaf migrated towards the chargers. Cause one screw up and another screw up. They all seem to find each other. And 
that's what happened. And it kind of worked out too, because like you did come away with Philip Rivers and uh and Ladanian Tomlinson. Like there were some good teams after that. It yeah. just couldn't quite get over that hump. Did you ever think with any of the teams that okay? I've been through what I've been through. Guys are getting struck by lightning. There's not a lot of hope here, but we might have a decent team this year. Um, I think, oh, God, was it early 2000s? Because I know 2006 was a year you went 14-2, and two, but yeah. then lost in the divisional round to the Patriots. Then the next year, lost in the AFC Championship to them. Uh, the Patriots, they just... Just run that run. Yeah. It was going to be tough to get past them. I feel like that was, it seems like when the Chargers are good, there's always another team on a good run, like the Patriots, like the Steelers. Steelers. Or the 49ers. You know, the, the Steelers here, they happen to scoop by on that one game. Um, I don't, I think there's, there's, there's excitement around it, but again, we're always waiting for the other shoe to fall. Yeah. Um, Oh, we won our divisional. Oh, we gotta go to freaking New England. Great. Um, oh, Brady's still playing. Great. You know, type of deal. Or you know, when they lost Indianapolis, um, I think it was I think Peyton was there. I think it was a playoff. Yeah, another Manning. Yep, the Mannings again. I played Peyton. Freaking awesome. You know, so there's the Simon, and there's also that. Hey, we're first. Our offense is. First scoring offense in the league, and our defense is the best defense in the league, but yet we still miss the playoffs. That makes sense to me as a San Diego fan. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a, a comfort that comes in that. Like it would be weird and unsettling if they were good and nothing went wrong. You wouldn't like that. I mean, we were first in two things. We just didn't yeah. get a trophy. They already get to play extra games. <laughs> exactly. So there you go. And then the team has since moved to Los Angeles. You mentioned some ownership issues you had. What What are your thoughts on the move to Los Angeles as someone born and raised in San Diego? Do you still are you still a fan of the Chargers? Fuck no. Fuck no. That would I, that would irritate me as well. Um, I, I'm a I'm a loyal person and. Uh, and so I grew up a Charger fan, and no, I'm a homer. I'm a San Diego State fan. I'm a Padre fan. Um, that's really the only major. We have minor league sports. The San Diego Goals, who's a minor league affiliate for the Anaheim Ducks. You know, we have a newer soccer team called the Soccers. But anyways, it's beside the point. No, I'm a homer. Everything San Diego is what I root for. Yes, I am a huge Nebraska fan. Don't ask me how that happened. I just remember seeing one game against Colorado and some dude took a pitch and went 80 yards down the field and scored a touchdown. And my favorite color is red. He was wearing red and white. That's my favorite team. Boom. San Diego, I'm a homer. So, um, and as a San Diego, and there's like this weird ingrained disdain and dislike for LA. So, we're Southern California. No, we're actually Southern California. We're further south than you are. <laughs> You're just bigger than us. Um, but them leaving... Uh, I, I I really stopped watching NFL once they left. Uh, my focus became more college football after they left. Uh, there's just so much back and forth and finger pointing from the politicians to the Spanos family. You know, um, you would hear, oh, well, San Diego, uh, not governor, mayor, would come out and say, hey, we're offering this, this much money. It's going to pass on the on the ballot. We just need you to sign off on it. No, we don't want to. You're bugging us about a new stadium, and it's hard to get San Diego to vote for new stuff. I mean, the Padres had to win the NL and get into the World Series and slightly put us, slightly secretly put that on the ballot for us to get Petco. You know, that's how they got the new stadium. Uh if I understand correctly, and I could be wrong on this, but I think when the Chargers went to the Super Bowl that year, they tried to do something very similar, try to get more talk about the stadium. But San Diego was kind of, eh. and then the next year they they got beat in the wild card. And I don't think they made the playoffs after that. 
So that kind of died real quick. <clears throat> but from my point of view as a fan and as a San Diegoan, the powers that be gave options to the Chargers. All the time there was a new site somewhere in San Diego County to build a stadium. And it just seemed like the Spanos family, primarily the son, didn't want to be in San Diego anymore. And so they moved to L.A., which I think it's really funny that they don't have their own stadium in L.A. They're paying, uh, uh, what's his name, Cook? The owner? Yeah, yep. Look, the owner money to use that stadium. It's not their stadium, you know, but they could have had their own stadium down here. Not down here. I'm, I'm in Northern California now, but down in San Diego for basically off of taxpayer money for the most part. So it, it is was- confusing too, because it doesn't seem like Los Angeles really embraces them as their team. I mean, you're automatically going to be behind the Lakers and the Dodgers because that's what LA cares about. In the and, yeah. Oh. Yep. And it's just like, I don't know why you would do that because Southern Cal, their football team is more popular than, than the Chargers. Like, I don't know. You're, you're like fifth or sixth in town. It didn't make any sense to me to do that. And I almost always blame the owners for this because I I just don't think it's – how many cities have really kicked a sports franchise out? Like, yeah. there have probably been – I'm sure there have been some where they were super difficult to work with and you weren't going to get a new stadium, whatever. But it's almost always ownership's fault, I feel. And, like, if you want a new stadium, you make it happen. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think there was also this, this – I don't want to call him jaded, but it could be it. Uh, Spenos, I read, this is an article I read a couple years ago before they moved, was that he expected moving to L.A. and build new Charger fans in L.A. No, the first thing, if anybody who has ever been to a San Diego Charger game, even when they're winning, it's really hard for that stadium to be more than 75% Charger fans. And when you're losing... You're lucky to find 20% Charger fans. You know, there's this video, you can probably find it on Instagram or something from years ago. The last home game, I think it was, it was against Oakland. It was all Raider fans in that stadium because he just lost support of the fan, of the fans. San Diego is a, a city that, especially football anyways, that if you're not winning, we're not going to show up because we're competing for tickets with out-of-towners. Now, San Diego is a tourist-heavy city. It's yep. also... A city that has a huge population coming from out of, out of out of the state, out of San Diego, because you know we had the Navy, we had the Marine Corps, we have uh, some manufacturing places down there, we have some uh, defense uh, defense department places. So we have a lot of people coming into San Diego who are from other parts of the world, and it's hard to have a homegrown San Diego fan unless you're like me, who was born there. Usually, you get Kansas City fans, and if the team their team's doing real well. They're going to bite you for those tickets because they want to see their team. And if your Chargers suck, I'm not going to fight you for those tickets. No. No. If they're undefeated, maybe. So this idea that, okay, this is all just my opinion, but this idea that if the article article is true, that Spanos went to L.A. thinking he's going to grow more fans just off the vine in L.A., who that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because you still have hardcore Raider fans in LA. You have now you have to compete with the Rams, who were also moved there, who, oh, by the way, won a Super Bowl. Yeah. What have you done? And you have the Lakers, you know, you have the Dodgers, you have USC, kind of got UCLA, depends on what they're doing. Also, yeah. Yeah. What Chip Kelly does that year. Um, I mean, God, you even had the Clippers. So in the Sparks. Right. Yeah. Yep. You got Spark, and you got they got the soccer club there. There's the just so many. Yeah. So there's there's so many other options, and they go see this team who now they're talking about firing their coach Brandon Staley because they keep shit in the bed. So their second coach since they moved, they had Lynn as the first last head coach. Yeah, Lynn, and now Brandon Staley. This and then who knows it'll be <laughs> to them. So. 
I don't I don't get the the reasoning, especially they had you in San Diego in the rain, nonetheless, cheering them on, and they left that for no reason. I think there is also um you know, I just took two different directions I want to go with um but like <clears throat> there's a lot of things they've done internally that were just been wrong. And I know we spoke before we started that there's just my grandfather had season tickets and it was um for a long time. He like had them since he went to San Diego. Because they used to be the LA Chargers and they went to San Diego. Um, I think that sounds correct. They used to play a bubble. Anyways, um, he had season tickets and then they went to the Super Bowl. So he had season tickets for over 20 years. And the Chargers, instead of like giving the long haul season ticket holders, hey, you guys get to choose first, they put every season ticket holder into a pot and everybody had an equal chance. So, like, people who had season tickets for one year got Super Bowl tickets. And that pissed off my grandfather. Because they do. I'm spending money every year for four seats in two different sections. And I had the same chance as some person who was a season ticket holder for one year. I've given you guys, my kids are fans. I'm a fan. My grandkids are fans. And this is how I get treated. And so he he stopped his season tickets uh, after that year. Yeah, he didn't renew his season tickets. He was so mad at them, at the ownership and how they did that. Um, but I was still loyal to him as a fan. Remember, he told me we're not going to get season tickets anymore. I was like, all right, well, okay. I mean, well, we can still buy them if we want. I didn't quite understand what was what what why he did that. It wasn't until I got older and him and I were talking about it one day and. Yeah, this is why it's like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that that is man, I need to that makes me want to look into it and see how other franchises handle that because that is crazy. You would think it would be like the the amount of time you've owned the season tickets would play a factor in that. That that seems mm-hmm. to make sense to me. Well, listen, if you put in a lottery, if you were a season ticket holder for 20 years, you have a better chance of getting tickets or something or, or whatever it might be. I know the playoffs, the playoffs are playoffs. So there's like, you can, if you want the playoff tickets, here's the extra money. Just give us money, the extra money for the playoff tickets. You keep your seats. But for the Super Bowl, that happened. I remember, we were all excited. It's like, oh, my God, I might be able to go to Miami and watch this. And then got the phone call. Yeah, we didn't get the tickets. What? Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. And so, I'm still, I was at the time, still a Charger fan. And then they did me dirty and left. <laughs> Went to LA of all places. That is brutal. A brutal, depressing episode we've had. Um, <laughs> have we covered everything from your 94 San Diego Charger season that you wanted to cover? Oh, I, you know, I do. There's, yeah, honestly, I don't really can't think of much of anything else it was a year that like i said it felt like it was our time for a small moment and that was going to be it well, i and, guess it, so we talked a little bit about the the childhood sports memory and how you're never that happy again but what specifically was it that made this your favorite sports team ever um <clears throat> That's because I was there, I guess. Um, I don't want to say I lived it because that, that that's just a weird thing to say because I didn't play any games. I was just a fan, you know. Um, I think like I think I said earlier is just being a big Nebraska fan. My information about Nebraska at that time was whatever the commentator for the Colorado Nebraska game said, or whatever the commentator for the Oklahoma Nebraska game said, or the little snippet on in the newspaper that just told me the Nebraska score. But I was in San Diego, so I got to see the news. I got to see the big articles, um, the front page, you know, Chargers win again or bolt up or whatever the hell it was. You know, I was there for that. I got to see that every day and every Monday after the Sunday games. So being a part of that and going to the games, uh, you know, uh, going to the playoff game, going to the regular season games, uh, just being there, being a part of it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I don't remember because I was 11, turned 12 in the middle of the season. That was three decades ago. But 
but there's still a lot of things I do remember, surprisingly enough. And I'll look through the roster and go, hey, I remember all these guys. Some of these guys I don't remember. Some of these guys I do remember. Even before I looked at the roster, I'm reeling off names in my head. I remember the 0-4 season two years before, but we still made the playoffs. So that was kind of a weird for me. The for me, anyways, with the golden era of the Chargers. From the 92 season to the 95 season was like the golden era for, or, era for me. After that, it was just kind of, yeah, cool. We got Ryan Leaf. Oh, that didn't turn out very well. <laughs> oh, we got Philip Rivers. Okay, we're kind of okay. We got Philip Rivers, we got Drew Brees, we got Ladanian Thomas in. I remember Ladanian coming in and people got really excited because we had Ladanian and Philip Rivers and we had Drew Brees at that Ruben, time. Yeah. Um, so there's some excitement there, but like for me, I, I can't think of being as excited as that 94, 95 season. Just, I don't know, there's something about it. I don't know. I can't really explain it. I'm just babbling now until you tell me to shut the hell up. No, I think that was, that was about as good of an explanation as I can get for a question that is so abstract. Here's one that's a little bit easier. Tell us about the bogey blog. The bogey blog. Uh, not much to tell right now. Unfortunately, I'm hurt. But the bogey blog was just an idea I came up with. Uh, as you know, I had a business. I sold it. I think we had talked about year, like a year ago about doing talking about it, but no point. So I needed to do something in my life, and I started picking up golf, enjoying golf, and my travel too. So I started just creating a blog and uh, still working on the website. Is I uh, want to get some content first to put up on the website. Uh, Instagram uh, the underscore bogey underscore blog is the Instagram page. Hopefully I'll have some updates on there shortly, but it's just something to do. Honestly, um, once I sold my business, it's cool to hang around the house, but when you live with somebody and they come home from a hard day of work and they see you sitting on your ass, <laughs> they're not very happy with you. So I needed to do something. So I started doing that blog. Um, <clears throat> again, once I get the website up, uh, I'll post it on my Instagram. I, need, I haven't posted on Instagram for a long time, but it'll, it's also be it. It will also be called thebogeyblog.com once I get that up and running. Uh, and, yeah, that's kind of what it is. It's still in its gestation right now. I'm still growing it. Uh, I said with the injury, it's kind of hard to play golf when you can't swing the club. But I'm slowly working on it. That would make it tough. And I will put the Instagram in the show notes. And then when the website is up and running, I will be sure to share that as well. But man, this was fun. If for no other reason to talk about a bunch of dead guys and depress everyone who's listening. So ruining my day. I was so happy coming in here. I was like, this is <laughs> about doing this from like some spring. And I know some stuff. I can talk and this is going to be great. And Oh yeah, this guy died. This guy hit. This guy got hit by lightning twice. Yeah. No matter what you said that died. He's not really dead. It's this guy instead. Oh sh- yeah. Well, that's <laughs> some good news. Like the guy you thought was dead, still alive. So congratulations. Uh, uh, I don't. You might be able to find it on maybe on YouTube. But the Chargers did uh, when they came back from getting their ass kicked. They did a uh, a parade in San Diego, and my dad and I went down and. They just chose cars and they stuck a player in the car and we were in the parade. So you can find a shot. I forgot who the guy name. Holy <laughs> shit. Aaron Crean, I think. I'm looking at a name on the roster. He didn't play, he's on the reserve list, but he was in our car. He's, my dad had a red 95 red Mustang, um convertible red Mustang. I think it was like well, last year's they did a five they did, they did the five oh until later, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But we were in that, and you can see me kind of sitting there, my arms crossed, <laughs> with all these people around us getting autographs from this player behind us that no one knew who it was. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look that up. No, well, this has been awesome. I'll probably have you back on to talk about Nebraska as well. Uh, but yeah, go check out the Bogey blog. Like I said, that's going to be in the show notes. James, again, thank you for coming on, and everyone else, if you're listening as you should be, and watching. Subscribe, rate, review, share, comment. Let me know if you want to come on and talk about your favorite team. Other than that, I guess I'll catch you next week. Thank you very much, Brandon. Appreciate it.